Dad, no! Come here, Dad. You're acting crazy. Back off! I didn't want you. I wanted a boy. Yeah, I know. I'm a girl. Now get down. Today I'm talking about one of my favorite shows, King of the Hill. Again. Because my mind relates everything I learned to this show. I was recently suggested a book called Stiffed by Susan Faludi. A big boy book, which took me an awful long time to get through. Faludi, a journalist and staunch feminist, seeked to find the reason for male hostility towards feminism, which she did by interviewing and examining men over nearly a century of American history. What appealed to me most is that she approached her subjects with empathy. It would have been so easy for her to demean these men, who are often jobless, divorced, and bitter. But she didn't. She was sincere in her attempt to heal the divide between men and women. From the first chapter, I immediately recognized certain personalities. I saw her describe Cotton, Hank, and Bobby, men from different generations who wrestled with their manhood in radically different ways. It gave me an incredible understanding of why these characters were portrayed as they were. Granted, these are fictional men, but I don't personally care to examine the men behind the show, what the writers were thinking, so I'll be examining them like they're real people. I want to use King of the Hill as a vessel to illuminate the cultural challenges men face that Faludi presented. So I present to you, Men of the Hill. Cotton was born in 1927. His childhood would be shaped by an America grappling with the Great Depression. He attended Fort Burke Military Academy as a young cadet, learning duty and discipline, but it would be a national call to action at the age of 14 that would be the defining moment of his life. In 1941, Cotton lied about his age and enlisted in the army. He would fight in the Pacific theater of World War II, claiming to have killed 50 men and sacrificing his shins to do so. After the war, Cotton returned home and started a family. He found good work as an insulation contractor, able to support his wife, son, and Cadillac car on the job salary. I supervise the installation of asbestos in every public school in Hamlet County and 11 bowling alleys. Cotton was traditional for men of his era. He believed the man should be the breadwinner and discouraged his first and second wife from working, even though Tilly did take jobs such as a taxi driver just to get out of the house. Don't you remember that year I drove a taxi? No. Well, wait a minute. I remember you had a yellow car when I was little. His wives would cook, clean, and raise the children, and he would provide the income. This 1950s mindset would stay with Cotton for his entire life, because no time after would be as good to this generation of men. A post-World War II America was a time of abundance. The US profited greatly from the war, and when GIs returned home, they were ushered into the American dream. GIs were given free tuition with stipends, unemployment benefits, guaranteed loans, and medical care. The economy boomed and decent, well-paying jobs were plentiful. However, what the greatest generation benefited most from was the culture at the time. The Great Depression brought an immediate shift in American culture. Greed and competition had led to a national crisis, so leaders urged to reprioritize, to focus on social utility and national duty. The New Deal, enacted in 1933, would pave the way for these fundamentals, and Roosevelt would further solidify this cultural shift by denouncing selfish behavior. The Lone Wolf whose hand is against every man's, declines to join in achieving an end recognized as the being for public welfare. A man was no longer revered if he achieved personal wealth. He was revered by how much he contributed to his community. This is the landscape Cotton grew up in. And when he went to war, it was because it was his duty. A man protected his community. At 14, Cotton couldn't be considered a man, but the war would make him one. Depression-era fathers had little to depart on their sons, what guidance could be given. But Faludi noted that under the fatherhood of the U.S. military, officers, which acted as surrogate fathers, would lead these boys into manhood. His boys, to each other, were brothers, tied to a singular goal, and they shared an unprecedented camaraderie that was based in equality. It was a war that did not emphasize the star performer, but the platoon, composed of equally heroic men. This is where Cotton would make his lifelong friends like Fatty, Stinky, and Topsy. It was the first time these men got to work alongside their peers, without the stress of competition. There was no promotion or spotlight to win. Upon returning home, Cotton would be lauded as a war hero. He had faced an uncontested evil enemy, and had achieved manhood by doing his duty and proving his loyalty. 
companies for a time would value these traits as well. Loyalty to a company was rewarded. If you signed on to a company, you could expect to be there for life, ascend from trainee to manager, support a family on your salary, and be commended for it. It was a simpler but brief time when a man knew all the right choices he needed to make and would be rewarded for making them. I believe this is what men pine for when they say make America great again. This brief time when a man achieved manhood through loyalty, duty, and social utility. It gave men pride in themselves and their country. So it's no surprise it's romanticized. These are exactly the ideals that Hank upholds and still believes are true. But they aren't. And they left rather quickly. It's for this reason that Cotton would be shown later as increasingly cantankerous and lost in life. He had done everything right, made all the right choices. He had been the good son to America, and yet no one cared anymore. But even in his prime, despite Cotton's success, he had nothing to impart to a young Hank, no knowledge he could pass down to guide him through a new age. Without another virtuous World War II, Hank would need to find his own way to manhood. Hank was born in 1953, a baby boom son raised by his GI father. And at the time, America was all about sons. When soldiers returned home, there was an emphasis on restoring families. Suburbs popped up all over the country to create local housing for large employers. These companies, many funded by the government, would be the backbone of these communities. This dynamic was echoed in popular shows at the time, like the Flintstones, whose local quarry supported the town of Bedrock. These neighborhoods were built with sons in mind. Baseball diamonds and football fields were factored into the construction. There needed to be room for young boys to play. It was the age of soapbox derbies, Pop Warner, Little League, and Boy Scouts, programs that Hank remembers fondly, but also programs that prioritized competition. America, hot off a global win, became obsessed with raising its next generation of men to be winners as well, men who would be capable of taking the reins from their fathers. Hank would see these childhood activities not as something fun or playful, but as rites of passage, institutions that would mold him into a man. But institutions that are rife with competition, pitting brother against brother, produce a far different man than Cotton's brotherhood, in which they all fought together for a greater cause. Hank's institutions all valued the star player. There could only be one first place, one game-winning touchdown. Hank would not find the equality Cotton found on the battlefield, although he would attempt to convince himself otherwise. Hank often attributed his success on the battlefield of football to his teammates, saying he couldn't have done it alone. But in his more emotional states, Hank has confessed that it was through his own skill and his alone that his team made it to state. In high school, you blocked for me, but I did my job too. I ran through the hole, setting Arlen High's single season rushing record, as you recall. Hank was and desired to be the all-star. That's all these competitions offered, a way to stand out. If you had the best stats, the most points, you could rise, albeit briefly, above the rest. Inadvertently, these institutions that had hoped to guide young men into manhood had changed the very definition of what it meant to be a man. It turns out that winning at home, as opposed to winning at war, gives a very different lesson in what it means to be a man. More and more manhood became about who could capture the spotlight. And this is why Cotton was so disparaging towards Hank during any competition, because you were either a star player or a loser. This is your fault, and you got them weak ankles from your mommy, because I didn't have no ankles when I did it to her. Hank wasn't a good shot. He lost at state, and unlike Cotton, he didn't win a war. Which brings us to the defining moment of Hank's life, his generation's war, Vietnam. To fully understand Hank and his relationship with Cotton, we need to step back and look at the larger culture. In the wake of World War II, there was a noticeable void. The enemy had been vanquished, but now what? A shared enemy brings people together, but now there was no opposing team. To fix this, a militaristic America set their sights on communism. The Cold War allowed the men of America to rally around the space race. However, the Cold War would be no rite of passage, like what World War II was for men like Cotton. When America landed on the moon, it would only see one star player, Neil Armstrong. Kennedy claimed, It will not be one man going to the moon. If we make this judgment affirmatively, it will be an entire nation. But the glory and spotlight remained on one man. The Cold War was not an opportunity for the everyman to prove himself. 
It was only when Vietnam came along that it finally seemed like baby boomers had found their opportunity. Instead of playing with G.I. Joes, they could finally become one themselves. Hank would attempt to enlist along with Bill in 1971, but would be turned away due to his narrow urethra. This is my urethra. There was an unspoken feeling of regret and shame from those who didn't participate in Vietnam. Some, opposed to the war, participated by speaking out against Vietnam. The protest lines were their front lines. They participated in a counter-war. But the majority of men during Vietnam neither protested nor enlisted, and they faced the shame of non-participation. Even if it was a horrifying unjust war, they should have rallied with the protesters, or have enlisted and shared the burden with their fellow brothers. Vietnam seemed like their generation's defining moment, and it was as if they missed the train that would have transported them into manhood. Hank clearly suffers this shame. He wanted desperately to be a part of the war, to gain the approval of his father, to be like his father. But even if Hank had enlisted, he, like many others, would have returned home no better off. Workplaces and the military, all organizations, had been transforming since the 1950s. What Hank had admired about his father's generation, the emphasis on social utility, duty, and loyalty, was fading. The new American culture was more concerned with winning now. Following World War II, the economy was booming. Companies began to grow at a breakneck speed. Many areas, especially those funded by the government, became pointlessly bloated. This was the rise of middle management. Managers who held impressive, yet empty titles. These fancy titles instilled a sense of being successful, of winning, but only superficially. These professional men often provided nothing of value to their company. I mean, what do we create? We create wealth! The military would be no exception. Between World War II and Vietnam, the percentage of army men who were officers doubled. It was a boom of middle managers. These officers felt no paternal connection to their grunts like in World War II. They were merely focused on trying to climb the corporate ladder, to be the all-star. Officers during Vietnam scrambled over each other to bring in the best stats, the highest kill count. They just wanted a positive recommendation from their superior, and this had a very negative effect on the soldiers. The grunts during Vietnam would receive no fatherly guidance from their CO. They would not become the band of brothers they had seen in World War II movies. This lack of support left men to suffer in solitude as they confronted an enemy with no clear face. To many, it seemed like they were fighting civilians, women and children, and that was far from honorable. But perhaps what hurt these soldiers most was that even if they overlooked this fact, if they followed every order and fulfilled their every duty, they still would find no praise upon returning home. Cotton's generation, the World War II vets, did not receive the returning soldiers with open arms. There's truth behind the Unfortunate Son episode. In that episode, the VFW is disgusted at the idea of sharing their space with the Vietnam vets. Vietnam boys? No gap dang way. The VFW stands for Veterans of Foreign Wars, not briefer smoking losers. They don't see themselves as equals. The Vietnam boys lost their war, and they had the nerve to come home and cry about it. Men returned from Vietnam disillusioned by war and spoke out against it. World War II vets saw this as unpatriotic and derided these emotional displays, equating them to temper tantrums, acts of a child. A large portion of the country refused to accept the atrocities committed by America in Vietnam. One poll at the time found that 49% of Americans claimed the My Lai Massacre, in which American troops slaughtered hundreds of men, women, and children, was fake news. Go ahead. Many World War II vets saw this new generation as weak and pampered. They couldn't even win a war against some tiny country. Vietnam vets were denied acknowledgement as men by their fathers. It would be no rite of passage. In this context, Cotton's treatment of Hank becomes far more understandable. Cotton never acknowledged Hank as a man, but as a boy, and a loser of a boy at that. Around this time, women were waging their own war. After World War II, women had been reduced to fixtures around the house, trophies. They were to receive their identities through appliances, beauty items, and their husband's job. But now they wanted real, non-superficial identities. They were to wage war to conquer the frontier of the working world, 
And unlike the men in Vietnam, they had a clear enemy, men. As women gained ground, men seemed to be losing it. Suddenly the identity that had been instilled in men like Hank as to what constitutes being a man began to seem hazy. As they saw it, feminism started costing men their marriage, their job, their voice in civic debate. The world Cotton was provided, a world of clear-cut identities and responsibilities, was being taken from Hank's generation. You see, Bobby? Your daddy's generation's giving away everything we fought for! The war overseas was a bust, and now he was losing the war at home. The promised kingdom was crumbling. So what was a young Hank to do? One of the biggest gripes from anti-feminists is that women pushed men out of manufacturing jobs and into service jobs. With only so many jobs to go around, men know how to take positions that had them working with people and not their hands. Service jobs, like sales, typically provide an experience, during which having something nice to look at and talk to is desired. Women in the 1950s were confined to a box of nurturing and vanity, so they were originally resigned to service jobs. But times were changing, and men looking for work had to cope with this new position. Hank was one of these. Hank has never had a non-service job. He's been customer-facing from Jeans West to Strickland Propane. However, Hank has tried his best to reimagine this role, to inject as much masculinity into the job as he can. Are you gay? <laughs> What? No! I sell propane! Since Hank holds dear those 1950s masculine ideals, duty, social utility, and loyalty, he goes overboard with them to feel masculine. He treats selling propane as a social good, that he is invaluable and needed by his community. He acts as if he were a G.I. Joe, not the real one, that's his father, but he's the toy G.I. Joe, the commercial version. He has a clear enemy, butane, charcoal, electric, any heat that isn't propane. He has his CO, Buck, who he sees as a father figure. I'd never tell him this, but I think of him as a, a mentor. He's fighting the good fight for his family and country, and his loyalty knows no bounds. But it's just play. It's not reality. Selling, as opposed to producing, has no inherent value. But those around him know this facade cannot be broken. It would break Hank. For instance, when Peggy finds out she just prefers charcoal when grilling, she has to shield Hank from the truth and concede that propane is superior. I want you to choose, Peggy, right now. Which is better, charcoal or me? She knows how much of his identity is tied up in this and lets him play the role of propane protector. You lied, Mom. No, Bobby. I came to my senses. All of them. Except for taste. There have been brief moments, though, when Hank has been confronted with the femininity of his job. In The Company Man, Hank is enlightened to the numerous similarities between his wooing of a customer and a stripper's wooing of a client. We're a lot alike. Hank maintains his identity after this only by saying no to the customer and essentially not doing his job, knowing full well it could mean his termination. Now, it's a sitcom, so Hank didn't actually quit or get fired, but this episode acknowledges how often Hank has to reframe his job in his mind to maintain the illusion. Illusions are actually fairly common for Hank to utilize. In The Accidental Terrorist, we find out that Hank has been buying cars at sticker price his entire life, being taken advantage of by the dealer. This is only because Hank has conceived a world in his mind where everyone is upholding those 1950s ideals. Of course he would trust his car guy, because men are honorable and care about their community more than profit. Well, what can I say, Hank? I'm a salesman. I know, you're a salesman. That's why none of this makes any sense. When Hank finds out he's been taken advantage of, he goes on an endless campaign, because the only way Hank can preserve his worldview is if the car salesman gets what's coming to him. He needs the other men in his community to agree an injustice has occurred and hold the dealer accountable. Officer Brown, that's the lying, cheating man you should be arresting. Well, needless to say, it doesn't pan out like that. But Hank is insulated from that knowledge. They let him keep the illusion. The most important illusion Hank endures is the one he maintains for his father. Faludi noted that baby boom men have an insatiable nostalgia for the greatest generation, more than the generation themselves. They heartily consume movies like Saving Private Ryan, looking on in awe at their father's accomplishments. Many probably grew up watching John Wayne as a sergeant commanding his squad in Sands of Iwo Jima. He encapsulated the stoic father, a stern pillar of a man who had a hard time displaying affection but deep down loved his son dearly. 
It was this figure and others like him on the silver screen that Hank would project his father onto. John Wayne was the father Hank convinced himself he actually had. Cotton was stoic, a tough son of a bitch, and never showed affection. Hank could excuse this outer shell as he saw it because that's just the way men were back then. Cotton, like John Wayne, didn't need to say I love you because men didn't do that. Mr. Strickland, I, 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 I love you. <clears throat> they instead, like in Sands of Iwo Jima, wrote a letter at the end of their life expressing everything left unsaid and how much they loved you. By seeing Cotton as John Wayne, Hank could keep the illusion that Cotton really did love him alive, that he was just a big softy under his cruelty. But of course, this wasn't the case. Cotton would die only seconds after referring to Hank as My worthless nothing of a loser son! Peggy, the only one to witness this, would allow Hank to keep his illusion and again lie, telling Hank his final words were He said to tell you he loved you. Really? It turns out that war, no matter how noble, teaches none of the skills needed to be a good father. Bobby was born in 1985, a part of Generation Y, the children of baby boomers. Hank was eager to have a son. It completed his idea of the 1950s American dream. Right after Bobby was born, he crafted a trophy shelf for Robert Butch Hill. He imagined the shelf would be filled, like his own, with incontestable proof of winning. Hank was determined to guide Bobby into manhood, not by modern methods, but by the only way he knew how. He still believed that his boyhood institutions had done right by him, and therefore would serve as a rite of passage for Bobby. Hank made Bobby participate in the Order of the Straight Arrow, he pressured him to try out for football in the rodeo, and he made him take self-defense classes at the Y, all things that were dear to Hank as a child. The very first episode even shows Hank dragging an unenthusiastic Bobby to a Little League game. On the car ride over, Hank explains how winning is all that matters. But Bobby just isn't into these old school male activities. He doesn't even like competing. As Hank's expectations are continually lowered, he takes any competition, like an academic team, to push Bobby to win at all costs. Your team is going to state, and that's all that matters. This ends up destroying any enjoyment Bobby was deriving from these activities, and worse, makes him feel like a disappointment to his father. I'm not just a big disappointment to you. When Bobby becomes passionate about growing roses, seeing it as a calming and rewarding hobby, Hank immediately pressures him into a rose growing competition. Throughout the episode, Hank takes more and more control of growing Bobby's roses, because he fears he won't win. And this episode is the perfect illustration of how men like Hank really viewed their sons. The competitions, the trophies they'd win, are merely reflections of themselves. If they grew up equating manhood to winning, then their son's victories were an extension of their own masculinity. Bobby is going to state. We did it, Peggy. This is why Hank is always far more passionate about Bobby winning than Bobby is himself. But Hank must know on some level that this is a meaningless effort. For what does winning a game or a rose growing competition say about the character of a man? Honorable men have utility. They don't waste their efforts on winning a game. Lao Tzu says the way of the sage is to act, but not to compete. What it was really about for Hank was gaining recognition from his father. He grew up being told to win, like his father won the war, and if he could just win enough, then maybe he'd finally be acknowledged as a man by cotton. This becomes abundantly clear in How to Fire a Rifle Without Really Trying. In this episode, Hank discovers that Bobby has a talent for shooting, a skill that Cotton ridiculed Hank for not having. Seeing an opportunity to redeem himself, Hank immediately enters him and Bobby into a competition to win a trophy, to win himself a trophy. In a rush to get Bobby to compete, Hank has seemed to forgotten how bad of a shot he is, still plagued by his lessons from Cotton. Although reluctant to continue with the tournament, Hank eventually concedes and begins to think that winning isn't everything. That's loser talk. You taught me that. Well, Hank loses the competition for him and his son, and he's met with the same ridicule from Cotton. He's again forced to confront his father's disapproval. But, to Hank's surprise, this time he's also met with love and acceptance from his son. Bobby thinks no less of his father for losing. He just enjoyed sharing an activity with him. Bobby isn't plagued with the same masculine ideals of his father's or grandfather's generation. 
he sees competition winning just as it is, an ornamental display of masculinity. Winning all the trophies in the world wouldn't make a man out of someone, and they certainly wouldn't teach you how to raise a son. They are simply shiny pieces of plastic and metal that culture convinced men like Hank would bring them acceptance from their fathers. Although Bobby, out of the three hillmen, seems to be the most comfortable with his masculinity, that's not to say he isn't in the most difficult spot out of all of them. Bobby presents as very eccentric, flamboyant even. He doesn't display the stereotypical masculine traits of Hank's generation, which is why we hear that boy ain't right so often. But for Generation Y, Bobby was following the masculine culture. This new masculinity still praised the all-star, the man in the spotlight, but now he needed to be sexy, glamorous. The 90s were the rise of the boy band, young men who weren't afraid to use their sex appeal to hold the limelight. It was an age where fashion, accessorizing, and hairstyling became commonplace or even expected of men. Anything that could fall under the umbrella of vanity was now being thrust upon men. Like service jobs, it was once the identity that trapped women, but it was now plaguing men. And that's because it sold. Far fewer men than ever were able to achieve the American dream. Well-paying jobs were harder to come by, and women didn't want to be trophy wives. So to reclaim masculinity, American culture sold it to them. It was sold to them as watches, sports jackets, home exercise equipment, frosted tips. It was the rise of the metrosexual, a passe term now, but a term used in the 90s to explain this sudden male vanity. In Hank's era, role models dressed like corporate managers. Men like Tom Landry, who sported a fedora and gray suit. These were their idols, and they presented as conformist and traditional. In the 90s, role models were not the coaches, but the flashy players. Players like Dennis Rodman, who kept the spotlight by standing out, not fitting in. For Bobby, role models were famous comedians, musicians, and actors. He could care less that Jeff Gordon was a race car driver. What impressed Bobby was he got his face on the Mini Wheats box. I like Jeff Gordon. He's handsome. It didn't matter if you were an all-star. You had to be famous, too. When teenage boys of this generation were asked about their aspirations, they rated being funny as their most valuable personality trait, and being athletic as their most prized skill. Bobby saw being a man as being famous, and he behaved as such. He knew he wouldn't have a ripped body or the looks for acting, and he knew he didn't have the skill to be a musician or athlete. But he was funny, and Bobby saw the value in that. Bobby idolized comedians like Celeryhead, and wanted to make three million a year like he did. His expectations consistently shot towards stardom, and it distorted his world view. In the episode Rich Hank, Poor Hank, Bobby thinks because Julia Roberts makes 20 million a picture. Then it's reasonable that Hank makes $365,000 a year. Whoa. This could be chalked up to childhood naivety, but this naivety only arose because of a culture that he saw only acknowledged the rich and the famous. A culture where manhood is defined by how many people know your name. And that gives unrealistic expectations. It instills a fear that if you don't make it big, then you are delegated to a sea of nobodies. This pursuit of fame doesn't mean Bobby's generation is soft or any less masculine. They are just working with different cultural expectations. Bobby was sent to the same military school as Cotton, Fort Burke, and there he faced the same trials as Cotton and outlasted him. Masculinity has just been slowly feminized, and that's speaking in a traditional sense. As Faludi puts it, women saw a box they were trapped in. It had clear limitations and a clear builder. But as women broke out, men found themselves getting placed into that box. A box that ties your identity to consumerism and vanity. A box that doesn't allow you to become a man through your actions. Bobby, I just want to say that you are perfect and a man. But only allows you to buy your manhood. There's a way to escape, you can become famous, but will that really fix the issue? I want to round out this examination with Dale, Boomhauer, and Bill. Although still a part of the baby boom generation, there's still a lot they can teach us. A book taking a serious look at the struggles of the American man was the last place I expected to find an explanation for Dale. But lo and behold, in Stift, Faludi examined a gun-loving conspiracy theorist named Mike Nicknolte. Mike was the son of a World War II GI. Like Hank and other boomers, he claimed his father was the silent type and lamented, I never really learned anything from my father. 
I definitely never learned what it meant to be a man. Mike followed his father's footsteps and joined the Navy during Vietnam, but the violence he witnessed destroyed his worldview. It was here that Mike began to doubt the government. If Vietnam was a lie, then what else was? For a while, Mike made good money as a fire insurance agent. He lived comfortably supporting his wife and kids. But when Mike lost his job and could no longer be the breadwinner, he sought his identity elsewhere. Mike had been a gun hobbyist before being laid off, but now it became an obsession. He also took a personal interest in the happenings at Waco. In his eyes, the Branch Davidians had been eliminated by the government as part of a deep state conspiracy. Mike was fully convinced the government was now the enemy, and Hillary Clinton, when she was still First Lady, was the mastermind behind it all. Throughout Faludi's time talking with Mike, he never found stable employment, and instead treated exposing the government as a full-time job. Mike's wife, who missed their old stability, continually had one foot out the door and came to resent him for not being a provider. Mike is a real-life Dale. Paranoid, obsessed with defending against the government, and supported by his wife. But why do Mike and Dale live this way? Why do they cling to this world of conspiracies instead of focusing on the family right in front of them? Mike claimed stockpiling guns and ammo was paramount to keeping his family safe, and yet he lived in one of the safest towns in Colorado and never had to use them once. Well, when Mike lost his job, he lost his identity. In his mind, he was no longer doing his duty as a man. To regain his masculinity, Mike dived into the only other manly duty he knew, because he actually did learn one thing from his father. He could go to war. He chose his country as the enemy. It wasn't a far stretch, he'd already been burnt by them in Vietnam. And if his new duty was to protect his family and fight the enemy, he could do that. He could honorably fight for his wife and children and remain a man. It didn't matter that his actual life was far from honorable. In his mind, all his actions were for the greater good, something that truly mattered. Dale remains in this state of mind as well. He sees himself as the protector of his family. Nancy needs him. It doesn't matter that she's the breadwinner. Without him, she'd fall to the enemy, so she'd never leave. It's this blind delusion in which Dale lives, fighting a fictitious war in which he is the only one who could bring forth the truth and protect his family. This is actually fairly common to see nowadays, considering all the economic uncertainty. Conspiracy theorists and gun enthusiasts are largely male. Doomsday preppers fall into the same mentality as well. If you feel ultimately powerless as a man, then playing the role of protector or fighter can be your life preserver of masculinity. Boomhauer's expression of masculinity is also fairly common today, because it's more common in Gen X and Gen Y men. For men like B-Dog, Faludi gave the example of the Spur Posse. This was a group of boys from Lakewood, California, who turned having sex into a competition. Each boy would get a point when he scored with a woman, and it couldn't be sex with the same woman twice, it was only one point per woman. The Spur Posse was an ensemble of friends who came up with the idea while playing high school sports. They were always competing for the best stats, trying to be the MVP. So they took this competitive nature they were brought up with and applied it to sex. When a slew of arrests took place due to a report of statutory rape, the media took notice and made these boys a media sensation. Members would soon find themselves on TV, talking to the likes of Maury Povich and Jane Whitney. They weren't being commended by the media, they were being framed as villains, but America looked on with fascination anyway. They were overnight celebrities, and when Faludi interviewed these boys, it was clear that this was their goal all along. The sex itself was of no concern to the Spur Posse. It was racking up those points and getting the spotlight for such an achievement that obsessed them. A few deluded themselves into thinking that this would be their big break, the jumping off point for some grand career in Hollywood. Like I mentioned with Bobby, they just didn't want to be nobodies. It didn't matter if the world saw them as villains, being notorious was just as good as being famous. Boomhauer can be understood through a mix of baby boom and Gen Y masculinity. As a boomer, his manhood can't be questioned if he's winning, and if we mix in a little Gen Y vanity, the desire to be sexy, the competition becomes picking up women. In I'm With Cupid, we are shown exactly how Boomhauer achieves this. He simply shotguns into a crowd, approaches every woman he sees until he gets a number, a point. This is your big secret? You just ask every woman you see until one of them finally says yes? Shut up, man, you gonna do it, tell me? 
secret, man. It's a strategy that is only appropriate for those who are just looking for a body. And this sleeping around, being a male floozy, is a common tactic for men to gain confidence. Pickup artists learn young men all the time, promising they can show them the way to manhood. It's why recently kids refer to the number of people they've slept with as a body count, like a soldier proudly reporting to his CO how well he did. Boomhauer may not be famous, but he's a legend for his endeavors in the alley. There's also great security in being a ladies' man. There's no emotional risk. We've seen Boomhauer be vulnerable before, and it breaks him. He loses all his machismo and regresses to a sobbing boy. As long as he keeps women as just a number, he can maintain his masculinity. I've saved Bill for last because I think he has the most to teach us. If we examined Bill's life, that is to say, looked at everything but his depressive moments, he honestly exemplifies the image of a good man, more so than anyone I've discussed already. Let's pick it apart. His job. Bill has a great job, he has a career. He's already served in the army for over 20 years. He could retire with great benefits, assuming he hasn't blown all his money on expensive dates or risky stocks. If I use my savings and take out a second mortgage on my house, can I open a trading account? Not only does his career provide a stable life, but he's passionate about it. He's loyal to his job and proud of his work. He excels at his craft and is knowledgeable about what he does. You got those big, thick neck muscles that nod up when you're tense, leaving that deep, deep valley, and then the northern ridge runs almost transverse to the crown. The show tries to emasculate Bill by having his job be cutting hair, a service job, but Bill clearly put in the time and effort to be good at something he deems useful. Bill, unlike Hank and Boomhauer, actually has a skill he could pass on to a son, and this is proven when he takes Luann under his wing and guides her towards success. Other than his job, Bill is shown to always put his community before himself, whether that be his friends, his town, or even a stranger down on their luck. Hank, who is committed to the bootstraps mentality, rarely shows compassion to those he deems unworthy. Hank struggles to even express compassion or most emotions. Hank, I need you! I, I'm in so much pain! I'm, I'm really alone! <laughs> Well, uh, I don't want to keep you, Enrique. While Hank flounders in baby boom masculinity, Bill embodies the nostalgic World War II ideals of a man and then some. He's loyal, has a sense of duty, and strives for social utility. But he also exhibits feminine qualities like compassion, empathy, and tenderness. He displays nurturing qualities. Bill is all around the best version of a man on Rainy Street. The only problem is he's depressed. We only hear about Bill's father very briefly, but it was not a good relationship and possibly quite abusive. My daddy spanked me every day from when I was nine till I was 16 and I turned out okay. You know, my dad used to punish me by telling me I was a girl. <laughs> he used to make me wear dresses. I can't tell you how many nights he locked me in that rabbit hutch. <laughs> I deserved it though. I just couldn't listen. This is most likely the origin of Bill's neediness, and it caused a cascade of poor relationships to follow. His abusive ex-wife, Lenore, took advantage of his kind nature and desperate need for approval, and cemented his insecurities. For the rest of his life, Bill would be tethered by these experiences, unable to project confidence and stand on his own, instead grovel for the least bit of affection. The only time Bill has been able to be his best self, which is a strong, supportive man, is when he's been a part of an equally supportive community of men. Faludi devotes a great deal of her book to illustrate how important all male groups are for some men. Brotherhoods, like in World War II, that were born from young men who needed that connection to remain strong. Bill is constantly seeking this kind of camaraderie. The army, too corporate now, doesn't foot the bill. Sometimes he's tried to manufacture this by being a father figure, like when he started his halfway house. But that's not the same. Bill doesn't want children, he wants brothers, equals. The two most successful groups for Bill have been the male chorus and the murderball sports team. The chorus failed because one, it would have put him AWOL, and two, because his friends deemed it too feminine, and the sports team failed because Bill wasn't actually paraplegic, just diabetic. But while he was a part of these communities, Bill thrived. He wasn't a man alone anymore. Here, I feel heard and accepted and, dare I say, loved. And this brings me to my fundamental takeaway from Faludi's book. 
America has always flirted with this romantic notion of the man alone against the world, your Clint Eastwood type, but that wasn't always the case. Daniel Boone is a famous folk hero who we today remember for bravely going out on his own to conquer the frontier. He was a man alone, self-sufficient and unencumbered by the worries of society. But to end the tale of Daniel Boone there would be an injustice to the man. He wasn't off to be his own man. He set out to find land for his family. His solo adventuring is only half the story. Boone's actual accomplishments began once he found suitable land to build up a community. And that is what used to be masculine. According to historian E. Anthony Rotundo, men of the colonial and revolutionary eras were judged by their contribution to the larger community. But obviously this would change. New folk heroes like Davy Crockett would champion the solitary man as the epitome of masculinity. Although brief periods like the Depression and World War II would once again praise the community man, we would slide right back to idolizing the Rambos, the Mad Maxes, the Survivor Mans. Our culture fawns over the solitary man without thinking how it traps him. When the Citadel, an all-boys military school, was forced to let women join their ranks, they were furious. And it wasn't because they hated women, as Faludi noted, but because it would have exposed their male intimacy to the world, their reliance on other men. Within the walls of the Citadel, men found a bond between each other that the outside world didn't allow. Faludi would describe their actions as paternal mothering. Cadets would help each other tuck in their shirts, allow each other to cry. A student would remark, with no women, we can hug each other. And a teacher stated, there's an affectionate intimacy that you will find between cadets. With this security, they can, without being defensive, project tenderness to each other. They saw the infiltration of women as the end of their intimate fraternity. Feminists fighting to open the school to girls would be unable to understand this reasoning. If men wanted to be more open with each other, why didn't they just do so? As they saw it, men created the culture, so they should be able to change it. But it's not that simple. Men continued to create brotherhoods in disguise. AA meetings, religious groups, gun clubs. And notice how none of those are teams. None of them involve competition. Because a brotherhood breaks when there's not equality. No one man can be proven better than the other, or it lets our culture of winning take over. Now I'm not saying that men being ashamed of needing other men is the problem. Oh god, this is a support group. Hey, hey, we are not a support group. We're hobbyists. It's not. It's just the barrier to finding solutions to problems. Men are constantly told to look within themselves to fix their problems, that all difficulties faced should be handled alone and overcome through sheer will. This is a fundamental belief for Hank. He looks down upon any man needing emotional support. But if men are facing a societal problem, then we'll never get anywhere or even spot the problem by looking inward. Our culture has a history of keeping men fractured emotionally from each other. Every man is supposed to be in control of their own life, to remain in the driver's seat. But the problem is, this metaphorical steering wheel we're supposed to be controlling is actually just for show. We're actually being steered by consumerism, government, and culture. Our individual actions have no effect on our identity in society. Cotton's masculinity was a product of time and place, being American, coming into adulthood after World War II, and rampant sexism. Hank's masculinity was dictated by a culture of winning, reenactments of the previous generation's wartime achievements through inconsequential games, using trophies as toy medals. And Bobby's masculinity was manufactured by a consumerist culture. It was all spotlights and applause, a generation obsessed with growing up to be on MTV Cribs. And none of these paths to manhood were chosen. Cotton nor Hank nor Bobby were in the driver's seat. Their path was already decided by the culture at the time. And this is why father-son relationships are so troubled for the hillmen. Since culture is always evolving, the path to manhood is always changing. And so a father has no idea how to guide his son into manhood, and a son looking for guidance can feel failed by their father. Generational advice is useless if the rules keep changing. Like how infuriating it was to hear that walking up to a manager and giving him a firm handshake would land you a job. Not only is generational advice frequently outdated by the time it's given, but it's often counterproductive. There's millions of young men out there dying for guidance, hoping to find a path towards manhood. And they end up clinging to father figures like Jordan Peterson, who regurgitate outdated ideas of masculinity that keep promoting the solitary, stoic man. 
I call out Peterson in particular because his rise to fame illuminated just how dire the problem is. Young men are desperate for guidance, but personalities like Peterson only reinforce the idea that men must struggle in isolation, that the only thing holding men back is themselves. What I tell people consistently is that they have to look to themselves. It's a tired rhetoric that discourages relying on others in forming a brotherhood. JP, as I'll call him, like Hank, have this romanticized version of the 1950s masculine identity. Not the actual identity, which championed community involvement, but the silver screen version, the John Wayne version. JP actually stresses not getting involved in your community, at least until you have built yourself up from within. Do, do you think collective responsibility overrides individual responsibility in a huge issue like that? No. <laughs> okay. I don't. Okay. I, I think that generally, I think that generally, I think that generally, I think that generally. He misses the point entirely that it is through community action that we build ourselves up. It's through social utility that we become men. Masculinity in America is lacking a real identity, and it's making some men upset. Some are trying to point the finger at illegal aliens, feminists, or government conspiracies, but that's just picking a random opponent to not feel so lost. We won't arrive at a solution by starting a Vietnam, and we won't receive the guidance we need from men like JP. We need a brotherhood without competition and without a spotlight. We shouldn't strive to be John Wayne, Salaryhead, or Rambo, and why would we want to be? To quote Sylvester Stallone, I have to be my own country. I have to be my own citadel. No one's going to watch my back. No, I can't speak for anyone else, but that sounds terrible. <laughs>